Hello, everyone. That was a remarkable film that we just watched about a truly inspiring journalist. What's more, we have her here with us at RightsCon. Maria Ressa, thank you so much for joining us. It's an absolute privilege to have you here. Oh, Mar thank you for having me. You know, Maria, you don't need an introduction, so let me introduce myself. My name is Supriya Sharma. I'm the executive editor of uh, Scroll.in, one of India's independent news websites that the government now wants to regulate through new sweeping information technology rules that have caused such consternation that, can you believe it, Facebook has sued the Indian government over privacy. What we're seeing in Philippines and in India is, of course, part of a larger battle over information that's unfolding across the world. And Maria, you've been right in the thick of it. You were among the first to point out how Silicon Valley companies, in their search for profits, were enabling the rise of populist leaders and authoritarian governments. And the film brings that out very powerfully. I wanted to start where the film ends, which is in the second half of 2020, when President Duterte issued a threat to Facebook because of an investigation that Rappler did. Tell us more about that, Maria. What did it take to get Facebook to act against those accounts? So a lot, but it wasn't, I think it's called enlightened self-interest, right? We've been, we are one of two Filipino fact-checking partners of Facebook. And we started pointing out the problems in 2016 because that was the time when we came out with this weaponization of the internet series, three-part series. I wrote two of the three parts. And the second part, the, one of the pieces I wrote, talked about how Facebook algorithms impact democracy. We could see it then. I had given that data to Facebook. Right? Uh, in this last one, I got to say, you know, we know the people. We know exactly what happened about a year before the takedown. This is the fourth takedown that, that Facebook has done in the Philippines since 2018. Um, we noticed that government agencies, the police, the military, were targeting uh, progressive voices. And it's, it's like our version of McCarthyism, but they call it uh, red tagging, red communists, right? So they were red tagging journalists, human rights activists, opposition politicians. And that is dangerous at a time when there's an anti-terror law where you can be uh, a small group of cabinet secretaries can declare you a terrorist and then you can be arrested without a warrant and held for up to 24 days. So it's quite dangerous at that time. So ah, what we saw, what we saw were networks, disinformation networks that were targeting. We gave that, uh, we did stories and then gave it to Facebook. And what was interesting with their September 22, 2020 takedown is that they took down two networks. One was domestic, this one that we had, we had pegged, and they went a step further by pointing out that there were military officials that were actually and military accounts masquerading as human rights activists, right? So here you see the duplicity they exposed. Uh, but the second one was even more interesting because it was influence operations from China. And it was targeting all of Southeast Asia, but it was most successful in the Philippines, where it was campaigning for the daughter of President Duterte for our May 2022 elections, i.e. next year, right? So it was already campaigning for that. It was attacking me. I guess I'm a little favorite of, of theirs. But that's fascinating, that campaigning for a Duterte and attacking a journalist. Uh, and then the other thing it did was to create fake accounts using AI-generated photos for the U.S. presidential elections. So wow. these two were taken down by Facebook. So you can kind of see global the global power dynamics playing out in these influence operations. So what happened next? I mean, Facebook took down the account, President Duterte issued a threat. What have the last few months been like? Have things turned a bit frosty between the president and Facebook or not, not yet? I think in the Philippines, Facebook is in the phase of ducking, right? I mean, in a way, journalists deal with this all the time, right? We hold power to account and we know we are going to get clobbered in the time before social media. Uh, this is, you know, we know how to handle that. And you know you have to speak truth to power, which is also part of the reason I kind of laugh at the, 
the new definitions that the social media platforms are giving editorial decisions. Because make no mistake about it, what they call content moderation is just kind of renaming what journalists used to do, which is to gatekeep the public sphere. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, well, anyway, I'll, I'll shut up and just say, you know, they got a little bit of what we get uh, every day. Um, I think that, you know, it's sobering to know, to, to feel that. Um, but not much beyond that. I think, you know, the, the danger is there. And my biggest worry is the May 2022 elections, because if Facebook doesn't significantly change if guardrails aren't put in place, then I I don't imagine, I can't imagine how we will have integrity of elections. Which is what I wanted to ask you. Are you seeing any of the election integrity initiatives that were put in place last year in the United States, which by the way, we've not seen in India yet? Yes, absolutely. No, same as you, right? I think India and the Philippines share a lot of, have a lot of things in common. I mean, thank you for the chat we had right before this, right? Uh, Populist governments who use the social media platforms to insidiously manipulate people to make you distrust everything so it makes civic engagement impossible and the voice with the loudest megaphone controls the public sphere. This is whether knowingly or unknowingly what Facebook and social media platforms have done globally, right? And that's part of the reason that, you know, from 2017 when Freedom House or you would have heard this from me in the film, you know, they said there were 27 countries around the world where cheap armies on social media is rolling back democracy. To January this year at the Oxford Computational Propaganda Research Unit, that they came out with 81 countries. So 27 to 81. And, you know, this is murder, genocide in some of the countries in the global south. Uh, there have been, of course, Myanmar. That's your best thing. What, what we've seen happen in February in Myanmar, yes, Facebook took resources and put it in the Myanmar elections. But here's the thing. When the virus of lies hits real people, it changes the way they view the world. And our own cognitive biases make it very difficult to go back to where it was. And I think this is the biggest problem we have not discussed is what do you do with emergent behavior, right? When, when you get a mass of people, there's more than 3 billion on Facebook alone, the accounts that are there, they behave very differently from an individual. And that pressure exerts the individuals do things that they would not normally do. Every psychological study has shown us this, the Solomon Ash studies, you know, the, the six degrees of influence rule that has now on Facebook gone down to 3.5 degrees of influence, right? So, so what I worry about is, is how the way the medium delivering the news, the world's largest distributor of news, is actually shaping human behavior. And until someone takes responsibility for that, I worry about our future, not just democracy, our own future, right? Like as human beings and and, free, and having free will and the agency to choose our destiny. Yeah. Well, um, I, was ho I was hoping to hear that in the last few months, you're seeing some changes that are sort of more than that one action that Facebook took in Philippines. Um, but, you know, elsewhere in the world, Maria, we're seeing that this rather cozy relationship between the platforms and uh, governments is sort of fraying a bit, you know. Twitter was banned in Nigeria a few days ago. In India, the police landed up at Twitter's offices. In Turkey yes. as well, been friction over new rules. And as I mentioned, in India, Facebook, rather WhatsApp, which is owned by Facebook, has sued the government over these new rules. Um, do you think something is, is kind of shifting slowly, but steadily where the, uh, you know, big tech has woken up to the fact that the authoritarians that they enable can finally turn on them. I wish it was that clear, but I, I think what has been most effective has been public pressure, right? There were, and look, they haven't even really worked, right? Look at the Stop Hate for Profit July last year in the United States. Facebook didn't feel it. Um, last year, uh, the net income of Facebook was still a very, very healthy 
$29 billion. The incentive scheme of surveillance capitalism is still there. But the good side is, I think they're starting to realize that speaking truth to power has costs. And I think this is the difference between having journalists with a sense, with standards and ethics, with the mission of journalism being the gatekeepers versus tech companies who are run by people whose incentive is more shareholder value, right? Ultimately, I hope, it because in the short term, if we continue this incentive scheme, we will continue and deepen the dystopia the entire world is in. It will enable a rise of fascism globally. We have already seen this. And your country and mine, I mean, I, I covered Modi. I, look, I remember 2004 when Modi, like Duterte, was facing charges of human rights violations. And then 2014, when he became, this wasn't, this is a while ago, right? 2014, when he became your prime minister. Here, President Duterte, a mayor in in power in Davao City since 1988. And then he takes power with the help of Facebook um, in 2016. And so I guess it's existential. And certainly for the Philippines, the May 2022 elections, given that President Duterte's daughter, Sara Duterte, looks like she's running for office, isn't that interesting that Chinese influence operations were already campaigning for her, right? I'm hoping that there is greater transparency, that the social media platforms uh, open up and, you know, moderate the greed, take some real leadership and, and, and show us a mirror of humanity so that we prevent the worst of what human beings can do to ourselves. Sabria, so, you know that I always think about that time period post-World War II after the atom bomb. And it was the United States that did it. But when when we saw the 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 heart the, mm. the heart of darkness, when we saw that, the world came together to try to prevent it from happening again. This is the same type of moment, and the global institutions, the United Nations, governance, is weakened and isn't functioning. So this is this is really a call to arms for those who have power to look at the world again and to create a better world because the world that was is gone and there's something very new and and painfully it's a dystopian world that is being created now we either go with it or we make it better you know mario i've been thinking that even the small steps that we're seeing the platforms take how much of that is just the trump effect the crisis in American democracy forcing them to acknowledge their role and take some corrective actions. And I wonder now with Trump gone, is the pressure, this public pressure that you speak of, is that going to slacken? Because, you know, they've never really bothered about what uh, those of us in Asia have to say as much as they do for the United States. Asian lives don't matter. Uh, yeah, isn't that horrible that we're the ones saying that? But that's certainly what their the behavior has shown, right? I mean, look, the, the announcement last Friday, was it only last Friday that, you know, Trump would be off the platform for a period for another two years, right? Uh, for two years. Even that had this announcement that Facebook was not responsible for for January 6th, for the violence that erupted on, on Capitol, at the Capitol on January 6th. Well, you know, if you go back, and I do go back, Facebook in 2012 actually did a study on the role of emotional contagion on its platform. And the results of that study said that the network spreads that which is seeded, it spreads emotions. So if anger and hate are the emotions that are most amplified, right? This is now proven by study after study. Lies laced with anger and hate spread faster and further than facts on social media, right? If that is the case, then I mean, it, I, I don't see that the announcements, the palliative measures, the too little, too late, like it's great, to, you know, to, to take to take, to be proud of 
taking Trump off or to sheepishly admit that they can take a powerful figure off is frankly way too little too late and should never even have gotten to the point where any leader around the world can lie repeatedly to their constituencies, right? It isn't, everything is slightly twisted when it comes to interpretations of free speech and not surprisingly, they're slightly twisted to help protect a business model that has been harmful to its users. As Facebook or Twitter, have they moderated political like, speech by politicians in Philippines at all? No. No. no, but and, and I think it's interesting, right? Like I'm going back because I'm I'm writing a book and I think it's interesting that uh, that they've separated into two the political uh, disinformation networks from the commercial disinformation networks. But, you know, like when you cover the rise of terrorism and social networks, physical social networks of terrorism, they are hand in hand. These come up because politicians need them and they these gain greater power. So, for example, the rise of terrorism in Southeast Asia began in 1988 when Osama bin Laden sent his brother-in-law, Muhammad Jamal Khalifa, to the Philippines to actually begin the financial network that underpinned the terror attacks that were co-opted by al-Qaeda. At that point, it, was, it wasn't al-Qaeda yet, right? So I'm just saying we know this already. So why are we pretending not to know it. Absolutely. Um, yet, you know, Maria, for all the problems with the platforms, and there are plenty, there are also powerful instruments that give voice to journalists and citizens. Um, yeah, absolutely. Both Rappler and Scroll are digital natives. We have built our audiences here. Uh, in fact, in yeah. India, at least, uh, you know, with the mainstream media entirely towing the government line, um, in fact, sections of it even turning into disinformation machines. In the worst case, spewing hate against minorities. The platforms really seem like the last available space for independent journalism and for critical voices. And, you know, so it's that even as we're trying to get the platforms to clamp down on uh, disinformation and hate speech, there's also an attempt to get them to not buckle under government pressure to close down legitimate accounts. Um, is that something that you're seeing in the Philippines as well? Yeah, absolutely. And guess what? News organizations have dealt with that power dynamic for, for decades, right? We know how to do this. So I guess part of it is that, look, uh, we are, we're all familiar with in 2011 with how social media was really uh, credited with the Arab Spring, which then became the Arab Winter because after the students and the activists used social media, here came government to exploit it. And I think the social media platforms weren't prepared for that. And this is, you know, it took until 2015 when I, I peg it to instant articles, bringing in news organizations. And then when we came on board, uh, the same algorithms were used to like, um, for a story on the scroll, story on Rappler, on the New York Times, on BBC for distribution as the joke that this guy told at dinner or the lie that another neighbor is saying. And guess what? The algorithms, again, by design, actually promote the greatest use. And how do you do that? By anger, unfortunately, right? Because the top rapper has a mood meter. And what we know before 2016 is that the, the emotion that always won in the Philippines was happy or inspired. Anger was second, and it didn't shift until 2016. So I think the first is truly to go to the core of the problem, which is that social media platforms take lies and facts, and they treat it all the same, right? They treat it like data, and they don't differentiate. Journalists differentiate. We take out the lies, and that's human moderation, which is far more expensive than having a, an algorithm that has the coder's bias built in to actually do it automatically, right? And I, I also laugh when they say, but how do you do it at scale? Uh, shouldn't it be the question be the other way around? Why are you doing it at scale if you don't know how to do it, right? And, and why is it the user's responsibility to protect ourselves? I sound like I'm so anti-Facebook or anti social media. I'm not. I know its powers. I drank the Kool-Aid, 
right? We helped spread Twitter, Facebook. We helped bring users on board because precisely up from 2012, which is when we began, until 2016, 2015, it was an enabling tool. And then they got too greedy. And then they realized that they can make a lot of money, but the cost is to humanity, right? So this is, I think this is leadership. This requires leadership on both on the social media platforms and American social media companies and governments. And, and, I, and I'm going to pull this out broader with coronavirus. I think this is ushering in an age where communities of action, you know, Rappler's uh, elevator pitch in 2012 is that we build communities of action. The food we feed our communities is journalism. Well, look, I just saw the latest Oxfam report where they pointed out that power and money Companies and governments, those who have power and money, have largely failed their citizens. And the effort to provide a social safety net has actually come from the citizens themselves. Here in the Philippines, it's the, it's the community pantry. When we just see you know, our government focused on either consolidation of power or our upcoming elections, uh, and not enough on a social safety net. It, it gave the first two laws that it passed for the coronavirus. So it gave a safety net to the, our large corporations. So I think this is the time for citizens, for those of us who are in democracies that are faltering, to come together. Now, how are we gonna do that? This is why social media is so important. As I castigate them, I also am their biggest fan. But please moderate your greed, guys. Otherwise, you're going to wreck our world. Well, yes, absolutely. But, you know, again, uh, what complicates this further, at least in India, is that Maya disinformation is spreading not just on open platforms like Facebook, um, but increasingly so, in fact, much more so on WhatsApp. And, you know, when we had lynchings uh, a couple of years ago, Exactly. I, yeah, I mean, uh, that was that was a story out of India that made global headlines and that. Yeah, uh, I mean, oh, you're frozen. I'm going to answer that. Uh, so. I think if you look at Facebook's reactions post Cambridge Analytica, right, what we've seen is right after the Cambridge Analytica scandal, uh, Facebook said, we're going to change our algorithms and we're going to emphasize family and friends. And at that point, news organizations around the world saw a decline in traffic from Facebook of anywhere from 40% to 60%. And, and then, you know, there was some slight shifting once Facebook realized this, right? But the, the reality is that when you focus on family and friends, you also focus on disinformation because it's the news organizations that actually give you the facts. And when you when you down when you when you push the dial down, then the facts become harder to get to. Right. And we do know Facebook has the capability to turn the dial up on quality news on the facts. They did it in the U.S. elections. They just choose not to do it because. It makes less money. At least that's my thing. I, I think the other part is there's a lot of initiatives where hundreds of millions of dollars are spent. A panel, the Facebook Oversight Board, where it spent two years and a lot of money to, to bring in really smart people. But in the end, all of these are red herrings because we already know the answer based on the data. And all of it seems to be tactics to just delay to give you just enough so that you are distracted from the fundamental problem of how you are being manipulated. And I think the hardest part here is that it's insidious manipulation, right? If you haven't seen the social dilemma, that's one way of, of looking at it, that every post you have is pulled together by machine learning and a model of you is created a model that knows you better than you know yourself, and then AI, artificial intelligence, comes in and takes all of our models and serves your most vulnerable point to a message to a company. That's the new advertising. 
or to a government, the new propaganda. And regardless of what you do, right, whether you click or don't click that ad or that message, it becomes part of what seen in oral from MIT calls the hype machine. Um, so yeah. now the question is with that, oh, there you are, you're back. I'm so happy. I was like vamping for you. <laughs> I just, no, thank you, thank you for uh, for picking up the thread. Even I, as, as as you know, I think my Wi-Fi is acting up. Well, uh, you know, uh, Maria, I was trying to sort of uh, get your thoughts on on you know this this new challenge that we face now, where we, we're talking about algorithms and open platforms. We're also now dealing with a lot of disinformation spreading on messaging services like like yeah. WhatsApp. In India, WhatsApp introduced features to reduce the virality of messages uh, after the lynchings took place. But to ask for any more regulation of the service seems to run the real risk of opening it up to government surveillance. In fact, that's actually what WhatsApp has uh, sued the government over, where the government's basically asking them to break end-to-end -end encrypt encryption to reveal the identity of the first originator of messages, which kind of just makes me wonder that is it that we now have a much bigger problem on our hands where technology has let the genie out of the bottle, but technology alone can't put it back in? Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Of course, you're absolutely correct. And I'm really glad that Facebook took the position it did. And you have to continue doing that story to make sure they continue taking the position that they did, right? Um, look, this tech has made billionaires out of people, right? I mean, out of out of tech people. But the reality also is that there is a lot of it that have been legislated against. So let, let me take it out of the information ecosystem and talk about genetic research, right? Technology has actually allowed geneticists to be able to, to look at our DNA and almost construct a human being in embryo. We can actually change the color of your eyes, or you can actually do this by design, design human beings. But is any, even geneticists, is any human being really ready and able to play God, right? And I think this is where in, in the Western countries, CRISPR technology has put Western nations have put guidelines in place around manipulating genetics. And that's important because they see the potential. I think that same thing was very delayed when it came to, in, to the information ecosystem. And, and you know, why should, have it have, why should it have been delayed? I think you and I became journalists because we knew information is power. And this information now has warped the world. Warped. Because now... A lie replaces a fact. Authoritarians are moving forward. Our democracies are dying. And, you know, if the Western nations can't hold the line, what happens to our countries? And who takes responsibility for that? So I, let me address the, the WhatsApp. I, I was actually there. There were so many meetings uh, where where this was discussed. What do you do? And the very easy one is to just limit the distribution. But it goes back to maybe throwing spaghetti against the wall when it comes to humanities, to shifting our behavior, when it comes to information, must be done within very specific guidelines. And this is where I do look forward to, I, I don't trust Facebook or or Google, or, I mean, Google has done a little bit better job, but depends on who you talk to, right? YouTube is rife. Uh, Twitter India knows this better, but you know, all of this technology has got to have regulations in place. It's kind of like pharmaceuticals. We put guardrails in place for this. Why do tech companies get a free pass? We now see the impact of that and that has to stop. So I look at the EU, it's democracy action plan, the two drafts of legislation, and you and I should keep putting inputs into that so at least the global south gets a voice at the table the uk has its online arms bill and then the us has is still playing with section 230 so they're a little left behind but i look at what the states are doing the attorney generals of the states are actually filing the cases right if we don't fix this now 
the emergent behavior, and this is the thing, emergent behavior in India has led to these mobs. Emergent behavior in Myanmar has led to genocide. Emergent behavior in the Philippines has led to, uh, okay, I'm going to watch what I say here now. Um, I guess I'm just saying that we are creating humanity's character. You know, we are, it is actively shifting like the devil and angel, there are individual battles for integrity. When you can make more money because you tell a lie that spreads faster and further, we see people, a lot more people doing it. So these incentives have got to stop. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to Twitter, for example. They're trying uh, a paid, a subscription model. Because if that works, then we have the power of social media without us without our data, without being insidiously manipulated by it. Absolutely. I mean, the platforms have to take far more sustainable corrective actions. And yes, I mean, it is, it is a complicated world and, and it is as much now a political problem as a technological problem, but the two are intertwined. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And their, their values have to be clear, right? I'm sure you're, you're going to agree with me. Uh, <laughs> so I'm putting words in your mouth. But if their values aren't clear, they're not going to be able to stand up to a government. In this particular instance, they stood up to a government, right? So they kind of have to put their money where their mouth is. And they should really stop the spend on palliative measures and get to the core of the problem. And, you know, I have... There's real reason I say that and I ask for solutions quickly because if this isn't in place this year, when we walk into elections next year, we will not have integrity of elections, number one. And number two, I could go to jail. I have real skin in the game. Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> this, this has real life implications for millions of people and directly for us as journalists. Exactly. Uh, in fact, Maria, as I was watching the film, I was struck by how calm you were through all of that. And you remain so calm. You're right here with us. You you know, it's, it's just really inspiring to watch that. But, you know, it also made me wonder that these attacks on journalists, one thing that it's doing is it's making us the story. And personally, I found it a bit unsettling last year when my name trended on Twitter because there was a police case against me for reporting that I did from the prime minister's constituency. And I know there's a positive side to it because there are many, many journalists who are facing far worse without any public attention on their cases. And yet I do wonder what the spotlight on journalists is doing to trust in news. Uh, we don't see ourselves as the opposition but we are being put in that box. We are being valorized on one side and being called enemies of the people on another. As someone who's faced this to an intensity of 100,000, what are your thoughts on this? What do you think is happening? I'm going to take it apart into two strands. The first is trust in news that you brought up, and then the second is the impact on journalism, right? So trust in news, it's, it's not just trust in news, it's trust, right? So if lies spread faster then you have a situation where we have no facts because not only do, do the algorithms spread the lies, anger, and hate faster, which means disinformation, conspiracy theories, um, you know, thinking fast, the, the system one of our, because that's how they keep us on the platform. So not only does that happen, but if you don't have facts, you can't have truth. Without truth, you can't have trust. It isn't just, in a way, news organizations, we're kind of navel-gazing because we think it's the destruction of trust in us. It isn't just us. It's the destruction of trust in everything, right? So I, I kind of joke when I put two movies together to describe the world today. I, I think now we are living in the matrix, right? And we each are performing our own little three billion plus Truman shows. And the question as I, I have is who is watching? Who is listening? Listening, which is critical to a working democracy, right? What do we do with information in the public sphere? Uh, you have to listen to that 
and then safely debate it to change each other's minds to find the best path forward. That's what that's the implicit assumption of a democracy. Uh, so it isn't just trust in news, I would say, right? It, it, I think social media has destroyed trust and everything, and it does spread what it's seeded with, right? So again, I go back to online violence does not stay online, and social media spreads this stuff. I think the second thing of journalism. The destruction of journalism, though, as we knew it, began a long time ago. And, you know, if you look at even things, if you remember in, in my gosh, was it 2018 when... When we discovered that Facebook had given us all the wrong data about video and how far it spread, right, to the tune of like their numbers for video were 90% inflated, right? That's that when they, sorry, say again. I said that that led so many newsrooms to pivot to video. Exactly, <laughs> right? That's, and that's the point. And so what happened? The incentives for distribution led to bad journalism. That's one. And news organizations that maintained the standards and ethics then looked at this number that was 90% inflated and fired editorial people and hired video people and only to find out a few years later that, oh, that wasn't the truth. So not, we don't even know what the truth is. This is part of the reason I call for greater transparency from the social media platforms, right? And instead, what they've done is, over the years, including the, the most recent announcement of Facebook, they've narrowed down the data that is available for researchers to hold them in check. That is disturbing, right? So, look, the mission of journalism has never been as important, but our business model is dead. And... You know, in many ways, I think Rappler is lucky because when we came under attack before coronavirus, uh, we, our advertisers were the first people to be scared. You know, in 2018, when the government tried, you saw that in there, when the government tried to shut us down, uh, I, by April 2018, so we're fighting all this in court, but by April, so a few months, four months after, we dropped 49% of our advertising revenue. And it forced us to pivot and create a new product based on what we do as investigative journalists, right? How do we find disinformation networks? And then create a product that would allow us to you, to do give that to a company. And that's, I think that's the new world. We have to create this new world. Um, but how do we do it? How do we do it with the standards and ethics, the mission of journalism intact? The incentives are very low. Who wants to stand up to a Duterte, right? If, I mean, I joke, right? Part of it is because I came of age in journalism's golden age. I'm a little older than you, and I'm really glad you're doing what you're doing in India. But we hold the line because we see the impact of what would happen if we stopped. Thank you, Maria. That, that was just most wonderful. We can go on and on. There's so much to talk about, but that's a really good note to end on. Thank you so much for, for joining us and all the very best for 2022. I hope things are better this time. Fingers crossed and, and good luck to India as well. Can, good luck to your team. I mean, we're navigating a really difficult world to human rights defenders, to journalists. Hold the line. <laughs>
carry that over into the political sphere and our political lives and governance. It may not seem like it, but lies kill. And whether that's COVID or governance, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter should take the exact same measures to make sure that the facts win, right? Right. Uh, well, there's another question, Maria. It sort of circles around some, some of the stuff we've been talking about, which is, it seems that now with the draconian new IT rules in India, big tech is being forced to do a delicate dance between protecting their users from their own government and continuing to operate in the country to chase huge growth. Uh, what do you think is the end game and how do you see this dance play out? I hope that the leadership of the platforms gain some balls. <laughs> I mean, because they have the power, right? And again, any large company has a responsibility to the public it serves. I would put that above shareholders, although the incentives aren't as clear cut. And so I hope that as it navigates India, I mean, there's there have been a lot of stories that have come out from India about, you know, the the people, the a Facebook head working with the BJP, you know, there's so many. Um, what you talked about in terms of the Pakistan and India, that riot, the mob that formed, that came after people. It, here's, it, it's a delicate balance and it will take leadership. And I think that will determine the kind of company that Facebook will become. And like everything, if they don't define the problem, I'm going to use their own words against them. If they don't define the problem, they can't solve it. And as long as we're looking at palliative solutions like the Facebook Oversight Board, um, uh, disclosure, I'm, I joined the real Facebook Oversight Board with Carol Cadwallader, who broke the Cambridge Analytica story, and Shoshana Zuba, who wrote Surveillance Capitalism, right? A whole bunch of other folks who really, it's time to say enough is enough. You've made enough money. Please show real leadership because this they will determine the way our world works. And I guess to look for what can happen, right? Let's look at 19th century in the United States. I, it's kind of a similar time period if you think about the robber barons, right? The sweatshops. Uh, because if they kept making a lot of money using sweatshops at the expense of their people, then there's a price to pay as well. What did FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, do, right? He came in with a whole bunch of other things after that. But I guess I'm just saying those robber barons, they gave a lot to charity to assuage their guilt of what they've done. This is that time period. And enlightened self-interest on their part. Real leadership, that's what we need. And I really look forward to it. Frenemies. Um, one final question, Maria, which is what would be the differentiating factor in a subscription model for Twitter if content surfacing algorithms are still in place? Would the spiciest, most inflammatory content still rise to the top of the pile of what people see if they're paying a monthly fee? Not necessarily. We have to see how, how Twitter rolls this out, right? Uh, because it's very easy. It's relatively easy to change the algorithms. Uh, you know, for many, many years, Facebook, uh, sorry, Twitter was chronological. Right. But then it, it grew to a point where then it personalized it. Here's here's and that's the main problem. Right. Think about what personalization actually meant. I mean, when when the tech guys were talking about it really, really early on, I was like thinking, what do you mean? Like I can make up my own reality, which is exactly what personalization kind of allows you to do. Right. That's why we're in our own little Truman shows when the business model is not dependent on advertising, their incentive scheme completely changes. Uh, Twitter also has another initiative, uh, I think it's called Blue Sky, where they're looking at technology solutions for these problems today, right? The algorithm changes. If they're getting, if more of us uh, subscribe, just like with Zoom or with Microsoft Teams, right? You don't see those platforms manipulating us. In fact, they make it easy for us to do these types of events. 
Well, once Twitter shifts to a subscription model, it must keep the subscription the subscriber happy. And being happy means that I'm able to uh, get the news. Well, that's me. Most people are on Twitter for the news, right? So I'm hoping. I don't know. This is a time when we should be throwing spaghetti against the wall. And I guess one of the worst things that I keep seeing is that the social media platforms refuse to throw spaghetti against the wall that would actually help prevent the worst abuses. So, for example, right, like we'll say, hey, uh, you, you can take this down and then they'll say, but how? And then they'll dive into the a, a rabbit hole of exactly like what does a woman, what does breast mean? Is it this? It, that's like that's atomizing to meaninglessness. It's the principle of it. Right. Go back. Uh, if you are, and now I, I'll shut up on this because uh, I, I don't want to rant because I really do think there are people there trying to find the answer, but their level of denial and obfuscation, this needs to stop so they can truly find a solution. And I have great confidence that once they define the problem the same way everyone around the world is seeing it, they will find the solution. Maya, just one final Question, what would you say to the rest of us who may scare a little easier than you, who also want to speak truth to power? I think you're doing it, right? Uh, I'm going to quote this last op-ed of George Schultz, which he published in December of 2020. He had been a, a, a diplomat for a, a hundred, I mean, he's, he was a hundred years old and he died earlier this year. And and the reason why I, I focused on that is because the the lesson of this hundred years on earth was very simple. And I'll summarize it in two statements. He said what he found out in negotiating all these treaties was that when you have trust in the room, everything is possible. Without trust, nothing is possible. You can take that all the way from nations to individual. Right? My, my best advice to some of our managers is, has, has really been to be vulnerable because the only time when we can really listen is when we open ourselves up, meaning you are vulnerable. When you open yourself up that way, you see new views, you listen, and you can find something. That's why trust happens. So what the social media platforms have done is to put us in our most defense, to turn us into attack dogs and destroy trust. And that is extremely worrying for me, both at an individual level and at a nation state level. Thank you, Maria. We'll end on that note then. Thank you so much for all that you do. Thank you for inspiring us. Same to you. Thank you for having me.